Hello, and welcome to the Paul Cardall Podcast. We're talking today with my friend Seth Mosley. He's one of the biggest songwriters and producers in the industry. He's here in Nashville. I have so much respect for him. He grew up in a very conservative Christian home. He was not allowed to listen to anything but Christian music. But he recently just did a big hit with Tim McGraw, and we'll talk about other artists that he's been working with. So here's my good friend, Seth Mosley. Well, let's go back and talk about how you even got into this, because you've already got Grammys, you've got a lot of Dove Awards. In terms of music, I got I took my first piano lessons when I was six and had um, probably, in hindsight, a great piano teacher. I mm-hmm. was just not interested in doing it the, right. the way that they, <laughs> they wanted me to. I, I've never been the type of person that enjoys reading music. I, 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 yeah. I can't, I still can't do it to this day. Like it would take me forever to figure out how to just sit down and play something sight yeah. reading. Why, why is it that the people who were not interested in taking piano lessons, that are not interested in learning the, the structure as children, why are, why are we the ones that become so success, so successful, you know, that was the story of me, you know, picking up music later mm-hmm. in life and going, oh, I really want to do this. You know, Paul McCartney never took lessons. Mm. Jimi Hendrix never took lessons. They play their guitars wrong because mm. they're left-handed. But there's so many musicians that <clears throat> never, but we rely on yeah. these types of people when it comes down to it. Yeah, the crea- it's the creative. I mean, when you're taking piano lessons, I, th- I, th- I can't remember who it was I was listening to on another podcast, but it, I, it, for the first time, felt like it said it in the way that made sense to me. Jeff Basker, actually, okay. who is big, you know, Kanye, uh, fun, a lot of big, big records. But he has that background. Like, he's, he's very jazz trained, classically trained. But they talked about this, and it was it was such a light bulb moment for me because what you're not learning in those moments in in that training is creativity. Yeah, you're learning to play something that somebody else made up, and so oh, that's true. It's just really interesting, and 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 I wish I had more of that. Like I wish I could do more of that and play classical standards and jazz pieces and stuff because yeah. I feel like it would help me in my yeah. own writing just to have that vocabulary. <laughs> But <laughs> I've always thought that too. Yeah. It, it, the genius of somebody who, you know, after I'm done with uh, laying down all the piano tracks, the piano that's going to go on the record, I'll send it to some guy who, or, or some girl who can just hear it, mm-hmm. and then they score it. Exactly. And that in and of itself is a gift, but they've worked so hard yeah. to do that. And, uh, you know, it feels like it comes natural, but... I mean, I think there's this process that, you know, you work at something, you work at something, and then it becomes part of you, Yeah, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and I think, I just don't think it was the part of the process that I was that interested in, and it really still isn't. Yeah. Like, I'm not that impressed with, I mean, I, I'm very impressed with amazing musicianship, because we get to work with amazing musicians all day, but... I've just never been somebody who cares about guitar solos and like <laughs> nine minute jam stuff. That's just, I, I, I get bored with it. Like I could never go to a Fish concert. Like that would just be. <laughs> that's, that's you being born in the 80s because you know, if you come out of the 70s, you're like, you want these, you know, 20 minute Rush songs, 21 12. Exactly. You want the, con- <laughs> the concept records, you want the Slash yeah. doing his solo in, you know, all the Guns N' Roses tunes. And I admire it for about two minutes. <laughs> Like it's it's incredible, but I, my brain is I don't know if it's my attention span or just yeah. what the things I'm drawn to are not that, and so I was always more what I've realized in hindsight, like the producer writer who I am today. That was the stuff I was always interested in. Okay. Was it was how was the song put together? How was it recorded? How was it produced? How was the lyrical uh, melodic structure uh-huh. composed? And how okay. was the chord progression put together? It was it was always more of those things that were interesting to me. Um, different ways to spin a lyrical phrase, like those kind of things. Weird ways to use a song title, or that you you know. Yeah. So it's like th- those were the things that were always interested to in me, and 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 honestly, um, for better or for worse, that's just sort of what I've the, the lane that I've ended up in, and it's. Uh, 
you know it's it, working it's working it's <laughs> at least for me it's work it's yeah, worked it's, and, yeah. and it's going to continue to work but i am still trying to improve as a musician though like that's been a big push for me is to actually practice yeah which was something i never did before it changes when we mature yeah we want to do things yeah yeah i want like i want to be able to play like i i played at my brother-in-law's wedding this okay. past summer and they asked me to play Pachelbel's Canon <laughs> which yeah on <clears throat> piano it's not that hard to play no but on guitar it's crazy hard oh yeah like yeah. to do the while you're doing the chord moves at least for me that's not the style of playing that I learned to do so yeah because it transitions into uh flats yeah you know um yeah yeah that's, that's so I, I spent more time practicing that than i've practiced for anything musically in my entire life like i was more nervous for that than yeah i don't blame you a, an award show or anything <laughs> what was your first album that you ever purchased um newsboys take me to your leader i actually have it your right here this is your first album was a christian i have the actual one a christian band he's gonna go get this, this i is have the actual one this is this is watching, a story i love to share yeah if you're watching on youtube you'll see what this is if you're listening yeah. so uh, so you, this is the actual cd no kidding that's, that's it it's, it's it's obviously broken and doesn't work wow anymore. take me to your leader somehow it's not crazy scratched up but i listened to it like look at that album art like oh just, but this was see this is the beauty of back then you get these liner notes the physical thing and my favorite thing when you got a new cd was to smell it yeah, yeah. this still smells got that it smell. still smells like it's hot off the press it's like brand new yeah. you don't get that that privilege on yeah what's happening today no. you know it's interesting it shows the age difference because your first was a cd and mine was an actual record was it a, like an eight track or vi vinyl it was, or? it was a vinyl it okay. was it was duran duran's rio yeah that's awesome and uh yeah yeah wow so so that's it <clears throat> and then fast forward to 2009 this was my first <clears throat> label record that i produced in nashville was newsboys born again and so Are that's you, that's wow. the whole full circle name like that's because of that like stuff you could never plan like i was uh when that came out was it 96 is that what it says on it yeah it's uh um, it 96 96 yeah, so i'd have been i would have been uh nine years old when that came out so you can't just it's just weird crazy stuff that you can't plan like how, how do you know that you're gonna end up working with them that's it that's incredible you know we share a similar story because the band that I loved more than anything in high school was Rush mm. and I still love them they're a Canadian trio they're yeah. the best band to ever come out of Canada and um, they they were with Anthem Records mm -hmm. so when I came to Nashville and I ended up selling my catalog I sold it to Anthem Mm, so that's the same as that company so it's the same company that wow. man that admins and publishes all their work and then they have their own label within it called anthem records but then i signed and they put me on that which is that's weird amazing. because it's you know it's piano music with yeah rush but it's full it's but the it comes, full circle moment yeah which yeah. is which is why you call this production right. place full circle yeah yeah exactly that's just all these all these people that i grew up listening to in you know at first in the in the christian music space but now in, in the country space um just had a song out with Tim McGraw, and he he was another guy. That, yeah, you know, was was always on. Like, so hold on, uh, hold on to it. Yeah, yeah, hold on to it. Yeah, and, so uh, catchy. First track on his new album. Yeah, what's yeah. the name of the album? Uh, it's called Standing Room Only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a great song. His first first single off that record too. How'd that come about? Because you switched from Christian. Yeah, that was a pretty doing... intentional switch. Um, and, and and I say switch because nowadays you, you sort of commercially have to have a lane. Yeah, I still love writing christian music every now and then i still yeah. i still love writing rock and pop and sync stuff every now and then but commercially you really have to sort of choose a lane um which is for you know for good and for bad yeah you need your niche you need your niche that people can identify mm -hmm. you with and and so um i felt like in the christian world things had just changed a lot and you couldn't do records like this right. anymore you, you just can't if somebody was to come That's along so and do this creative of a record in the Christian world, it would have no place to live. Yeah, and and that's where like Peter, I've become friends with over the years, and 
I think he's and Peter is he, he's the the original the founder the, yeah. the front man yeah so so when I came on it was reinventing the newsboys and this was okay. with, with the new front man okay. and so for me it was really weird because it sounded nothing like the classic newsboys that I knew and I was like man are people even gonna like this it's a totally oh, wow. different thing yeah this is before okay so this is before it says way way before Michael Tate, Tate. yeah and so. So that was even crazy because my second record I got was was DC Talk, so this was my first one. My second record was DC Talk, Jesus Freak, and so my first label record I work on is like smashing both of those worlds together. That's amazing. So Tate as the front man of the Newsboys, and you know to Wes, who's the owner manager of Newsboys, to his credit, yeah, he saw a path forward rather than saying, hey, let's just hang this thing up. We had a good run, and they're still out killing it today, so. Yeah, they totally are. They still are playing big shows, and yeah. for a Christian band to retain that over the years, it's just like the commercial market. For sure, it's the longevity know, is crazy. Strategy, everything. Did you grow up in a, a strong, because you, you started doing Christian music, did you grow up in a strong yeah, Christian yeah. home? Yeah, it was a Nazarene family. Okay. Which is, you know, for those listening, it's pretty much Nazarene, Baptist, Methodist. They're kind of all somewhat similar, you know, maybe okay. some theological differences yeah. here and there, but nothing that we ever were too, you know, cared too much about. Um, but yeah, it was it was a pretty strict uh, Christian upbringing. I wasn't allowed to listen to secular music, and I didn't oh, know, wow. I didn't know about Rush, I didn't know about Nirvana, I didn't know about Michael Jackson, you know, all of these. Like, I, I would have known about the names, but I wouldn't have known any of their music. But Christian CCM, contemporary Christian music, was totally okay. That was okay, and 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 it's what you know. Anything can become your normal, right? Like when yeah. you're a kid. So I didn't think anything of it. Yeah. In, in hindsight, you're hearing all the stuff that they were maybe influenced by, like DC Talk had, you know, Jesus Freak, Nirvana, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Right. Like that obviously was, like a lot of the Newsboys stuff. Maybe like um, I don't even know who it would it would have influenced. Like new. Uh, like a lot of new wave kind of stuff. Yeah, like New Order. New or, Order. Or yeah. Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, Yaz, Erasure. It, it, exactly. Pet Shop Boys. Yeah, so you hear those things kind of influence. Okay. But um, but still, that's what always drew me to that was that it kind of was still its own thing. Yeah. Um, and so I just never saw anything weird about it. Like I just grew up going to Christian concerts and then got to, uh, when, I, when I graduated high school in 2018, I had been leading worship at my church and starting to do my own stuff, and my parents let me have a little studio in their house recording my friends' bands, and so that was where I kind of was able to learn. But um, I bailed on going to college and just jumped straight into working in a studio in Columbus because I got a job offer, and that was where my musical blinders kind of came off because I was able to learn yeah. all this other stuff. Were you using Pro Tools in the beginning? Or did you no. do, do some Cakewalk or some Paris? Yeah, when I started, <laughs> um, I, I haven't used either of those, but it, Cubase was my first oh, one. Oh, Cubase. People are still using Cubase. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it's a great software. But I, I think I was able to get a free copy of it that was like cracked or something because yeah, I didn't have any right, money. a LimeWire version. A LimeWire version. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that's what I started on. I eventually bought it and bought, <laughs> bought the plugins and stuff, but then I switched to Logic because okay. that's what my... The, the studio in Columbus was using. Um, and I was on Logic until pretty much three years ago. And then I just switched to Pro Tools three years ago. It seems that producers are using Pro Tools and artists and yeah. songwriters use Logic. Yeah, for sure. Why'd you, sh why'd you change? Um, I was doing two records. There's a For King and Country thing and Joel is very hands-on. He knows Pro Tools inside and okay. out. So to be able to collaborate with him at the time it was just a really good thing to be able to be in that platform and yeah. pass sessions back and forth. Um, and producing King and Country was your first Grammy. First, yes, exactly. Yeah, oh. yeah. So, so I did the first couple of their ones on Logic, and then the the newest stuff would have been on Pro Tools. Yeah. But um, it was just kind of a necessary shift, and I I just feel like the more I've done in country, it's 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 all about real instrumentation which Pro Tools is unbeatable when it comes to that, just yeah. audio, actual recording. Wow. So That's in the weeds a little <clears> bit. A lot of people probably don't care about that. But. No, it's fine. <laughs> and we will be right back. 
not only is Paul a podcast host, but has gifted the world with award-winning music that's brought comfort to millions of listeners in more than 160 nations. His latest album, Return Home, is an introspective listening experience. Each song, carefully crafted, takes listeners on a cinematic journey to the lands of his ancestors. In all, Return Home features 13 songs, from his original piano pieces, Shropshire Hills, Immigrant Ships, The Shores of Normandy, Red Poppy Fields, Fathers and Daughters, Eliza's Theme, to arrangements of popular hymns, I Believe in Christ and Love One Another. Whether you just need to relax, study, meditate, pray, or for some other healthy reason, Paul's music helps create an atmosphere of peace wherever you are. Add Paul Cardall's album Return Home to your favorite platform, whether it's iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, or some other. For the sheet music and more information, visit www.paulcardall.com. When you came to Nashville, what, and we're kind of all over the place, but when you came to Nashville, how did you establish your roots here and find that lane that you were supposed to be in? Um, well, it was a very circuit, it, 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 was, it was not a straight line, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, I think like most people when they think of music like getting into the music business you kind of just assume like okay I'm gonna go make a record and write songs and be the artist and, and that's sort of where I started um, so I moved here thinking I was gonna be the artist I had a, I ended up signing a record deal pretty early on a guy named Ian Eskelin brought me to town he goes to conduit with us now okay so you were recruited you were you were brought here for yeah. what you were doing yeah so I so okay. I worked up in Columbus um, at that studio, and I had oh, my own okay. band on the side, and I, I sent him, this was back when we were doing press kits, like, yeah. it was like a manila <laughs> envelope folder with, with our little press kit. It was like, you're trying to get the media rate, $1.25 to ship out the, exactly. the CD with all the information. Yeah, that's, those that's... The, but those were the glory days, like with the CDs, man. It's so different. It's constantly evolving. Well, now it's just, there's no effort to send a DM. Yeah, you know, back a, then you had to spend $5 and put this, all this stuff together and hire a photographer and you know, print it all out at Kinko's or whatever. And so I sent it to Ian because he was one name that I had seen on the back of some CDs. And yeah. I was like, I don't know anything about Nashville, but here's a guy I'll send it to. And so the first guy I sent it to hit me back was Ian. And he was like, hey, you should come down next week and we'll, we'll do some co-writing, which I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. But yeah. that's everything that we do in Nashville is co-writing. And so we did that. He introduced me to some really really great writers um, took me around to some labels I ended up having a, a record deal pretty quickly and um, wow. so I moved down right around that point and, and it was still this sort of like bifurcation point where I was like I didn't even know there was this whole other possible path of just being the producer writer like I sort of thought that that was going to be the, the the artist thing was my thing yeah. but, but really what actually worked was the producer writer thing because I was doing that on the side like in the green rooms after shows or before shows or whatever. Yeah, it's interesting how the doors close and the doors open yeah. where we're supposed to go based on the gifts God's given us. And uh, do you ever feel like, man, I wish I was doing the artist thing that I was on stage? Do you ever feel that? Anymore? I don't now at all, no. Because I, <laughs> I know what it is and I, I did... You know, we did a thousand shows in those four years or five years or however long we were doing it, and yeah. kind of figured out. You know, it's it's things are really obvious in hindsight that are not obvious in the moment, and for me that was one of them. And um, our, the guy that introduced us, Matt Hammett, was was one of the last tours that we did was yeah. opening for his band, Sanctus Real. Sanctus Real. And, We've uh, talked about Sanctus Real a lot on the podcast. Yeah, we had. We had uh, uh, Seth on, yeah, yeah, and we had Matt on a couple seasons ago, and it was talking about they left the band because they were singing about family values, right? But they were on the road like 180 days during the year, and so finally they're like, 
we need to practice what we preach and they left their bands yeah and uh you know that must have been how you felt in shifting yeah and then but know. it was on it was on his tour that i was working on this little side project which was the newsboys born again record <laughs> and so when that took off um i was in the green rooms of and, and matt would come back and be like what are you working on I'd just, some newsboy stuff and i i honestly didn't know whether it would turn into anything or not and i was Super broke, but it did really well. Uh, first song went number one. Um, and then I, I met my wife right around the same time. We had gotten married. I was still doing the touring thing, trying to kind of wear both hats. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just such an obvious thing by the, by the end of the touring days that I was like, this is the thing that's actually working. Why am I trying to force this other thing it's like a square peg in a, a round hole. It just mm -hmm. would, would never work. And, and in hindsight, I can see, after having worked with some amazing artists, like there's a thing you have to have to be that person, and I don't have that thing. Yeah. yeah. I have plenty of other things that work complementary to that, but like it's a thing that you have to have to, yeah. to be that person at the front of the stage. You definitely have to have that. There's so many different you know dynamics of what you can and can't do what are some of the bands uh that you've been blessed to yeah to work with yeah well like we said i mean well sanctus was one in the beginning uh newsboys for king country skillet um skillet skillet yeah hold they, on though if yeah. if you had could you listen i mean back in the day was probably skillet probably hadn't come around skillet's a hardcore yeah like a, we would say heavy metal, like an Pretty iron, heavy rock, yeah. like an Iron Maiden of the '90s <laughs> uh, of to today. Yeah. The, yeah. What do we say? Do we say the millennials, the the two thousands? The millennials, I guess. Yeah. The two thousand, yeah. but yeah. but would your mom have let you listen to the Skillet record? I was allowed to listen to Skillet because it had Christian <laughs> Christian themes, and they did of a course. worship record, and you know. But wow. but I, I that was another full circle moment. Like I, I was the kid in eighth grade who was setting up their green room for shows. Really? Like and I just thought that was the most amazing thing that I could put the candy bars on the table for for this band. Because they would come around and they you come were coming tour. Okay, and so you were when bands would come through, you were working the green room. Yeah, and and that was just because I again you know I went to a a, a a Christian school growing up where okay. it was a big church and so they'd have. That's how it works in the Christian world is the, the venues a lot of times are the big churches. Okay. They're not necessarily the big theaters or whatever. And then once they get beyond that, you can hit arenas and all that stuff. But but at the time, it was Skillet would come through, Rebecca St. James would come through, mm -hmm. which, funny enough, Joel was running you know lights and sound and stuff as a little 10-year-old. So all these just same people that are in my life today. Um, but I just thought that was the coolest thing, like just setting up their green room and like writing a little message on the chalkboard, and, you know. <laughs> do you think, you know, Joel, uh, king and country, they're from Australia, do you think he intentionally retains the, the Australian accent, oh, accent for sure. just because they sound smarter? It's, it sounds more intelligent, it's a thing. I think people just think it's a novel. It's like a novelty thing. <laughs> like they know? just got off the boat. Exactly. <laughs> Milk it. Yeah, Luke, Luke has kind of... But he's he's kind of let it go, and, yeah. And, but but Joel Joel holds on to it. Luke doesn't talk as much as Joel. No, no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, they be they just they blew up so quickly. Yeah. And uh, you had so much to do with that. Well, I mean, it, it's just thankful to be a part of the process. But again, I mean, that that's a good example of like I I look at somebody like Joel who and Luke, who I've got to work with over the years, they, they have whatever that thing is that makes you want to be the person at the front of the stage. And it's not, I'm not saying it's even a negative thing. It's like, we need those people in the world. That's them, like yeah. that's him. He, he just would not make sense any, any other place. Yeah. And he sticks to his guns, he's a true artist. He's, you know, a creative in every sense of the word. Like working with them and they'll tell you like it's not always the easiest process they're very long arduous records to make but oftentimes a lot of the really good ones kind of seem to be that way is so. it arduous because of you have new ideas in the studio some philosophy some ideas or because there's so many layers i think there's number well there there's a lot of layers so that's complicated so there's ton there's lots of cooks in the kitchen okay so you've got three very strong voices, which are 
to the two in the band, and then David Smallbone, who's the the dad and the owner. He, he's not as involved maybe in the record making process, but still is a voice for sure. Wow. But then they've got usually two or three label people, probably two or three management people. And one thing Joel really likes to do, which you know this has been part of his creative process, is he plays stuff for everybody during the. It just gets feedback, and you know, so you're you're also getting all of their feedback too. Smart. So smart maybe frustrating at times, but at least for him it's worked, you know? It's kind of yeah. like having a little focus group of sorts. Yeah, um, and those type of things can get expensive. They get expensive, it just takes time. You, you end up doing 27 versions of a song and, wow. you know, wow, four, 14 mix versions. It just, it ends up being uh, just a, a long process, but at the same time, you know, I mean, look what those guys have been able to accomplish. You know, yeah. there's something to be said of what they've done is is a very unique thing, not only in our Christian space, but just in the whole music landscape. Yeah, they're well respected yeah. in all angles. Yeah, that's fascinating. Can you break down for for listeners how the music industry works on the production side? Because you said you're a producer and a songwriter. I would think you get. You charge a certain rate mm -hmm. to produce, yeah. and then your team does it. Mm -hmm. But as a songwriter, and I that's... would even say my, my that's changed for me over the years. What I've realized about production, at least the way that I've been able to figure out how to do it well, is it's not something you can just phone in or outsource. Like there probably are producers out there, and like the older school country producers, that's how they would do. They just call people and you know say, yeah, that sounds cool, um, but. The way that I've always been is it's it's very hands on. Like every yeah. note that's played, everything that's edited, like I'm the one doing a lot of that. And it didn't it didn't like I've I've had versions over the years where I would start trying to hire it out, and then I realized I was like hiring out something I should have not been hiring out because it's like if somebody's paying, you know, Banksy to make an art piece, they want him to be the one making it. They yeah. don't they don't want to know that it was. Yeah, that becomes frustrating when you hand it to the guy that you want but he's got to yeah he's he's so busy yeah. that he hands it off for other people yeah and that's and that's the thing that at least with me and it's it, i've worked with some amazing other people around me and it's not even to say anything less of them it's just and i still have but there's a there's a certain part of being a producer where people just want you for you yeah and so it's not a scalable thing which I've just accepted that it's fine, you know. It's art. You know? It's like hiring a singer. It's like wanting to work with that specific singer, but her uh, stand-in comes. Right. In. You're not going to be happy with that. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. You get the fake Barbara Streisand. Yeah. So I have to charge a pretty high fee up front for that, just because it's time. It's trading time for money. I get a, I get a percentage of royalties on the back end. But then another another piece that I'm involved in is is the writing process because I feel like as much as I love the production process, I love the writing process probably even more. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of records that I'll end up writing with the artist and we'll start it from start to finish, produce it out. There's other re there's other records where people will just hire me as a producer and it's songs that have already been written. Okay. Um, and there's the flip side of that where I'm just a writer on the song and then like the Tim McGraw thing, like his longtime producer will produce it. Yeah, what's the producer rate? right now what is the typical producer percentage yeah and i would say it's different from genre to genre i mean in in in, in the christian world like i would think uh, you know anywhere from six, 65 to 120 grand a record like for a full project um, but is that that and that's a flat rate well, it's that's like all in, like everything. Okay. Like my portion would would be paid out of that, but then all the players and mix and everything too would would also be paid out of that too. But typically, so so no longer do, is there a, like a percentage on the resid, like every time the song streams. Yeah, there's there's also like four. We usually like if you're an established producer, you can get four or five producer points okay. on the back end. Is that in addition, or does that is that towards? Say the sixty to one hundred twenty thousand. Yeah, part of it, and this is getting real in the weeds, but part of it <laughs> is is a is recoupable. Okay. But then, I would say it's probably like twenty percent of the overall. Okay. So so that part is recoupable against those royalties. So it's but almost then, like they're giving you an advance. It's part of it is it is seen as an advance, but okay. it's like a small 
percentage of it. Small percentage. Yeah. And then the songwriters, isn't it now like 3% of... Songwriters basically, um, th they get the publishing side of things. And this is yeah. where, like, just, just really, really high level for, for the audience and listeners out there, if they even care. The music business is so confusing. There's two sides. There's the recording side, which is the master side. That's mm -hmm. what the producer is responsible for. Then there's the publishing side, which is the intellectual property. That's, like, no recording at all. That's, mm -hmm. like, Dancing Queen by ABBA could have like that there's one song but there could be a hundred cover versions of that song right. each of those is a different master with a different producer you know over here the original songwriters will always retain ownership of that publishing and they split it however they feel is fair you know yeah so if there's three writers i always and, and this just i think is just a thing to protect relationships in my opinion is we're never about like counting lines and melodies and you came up with this much and you came up with that much yeah. it's always just an even split a team effort it's a team effort wouldn't it be nice to get the uh, residual income on the abba oh on the abba side? oh yeah oh yeah that... <laughs> or ymca exactly <laughs> <laughs> wow. If they even still own it, you know, they may have sold it a long time ago. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. It's, yeah, it's so complex how the entire music industry works. I get asked a lot, I want to do a cover song. Do I need to contact the artist? Yeah, we actually just put out a video, the most in-depth video I've ever seen on this. So I'll, Full I'll, circle put yeah, it out. I'll link it to you, and you can you can put it in the description or whatever. Okay. But but it's you do have to go through a process, but it's easier than it's ever been before. You just have to make sure it's done correctly, and you go through like there's basically three or four steps you need to make sure you do. But and it, it it's doable though. Is the majority of those processed through the Harry Fox agency? I don't even think it's that anymore. I think it's all like the Mechanical Licensing Collective is a part of it, the MLC. Okay. Um, YouTube itself has its own content ID platform. Um, if you upload a cover through a distributor like DistroKid or TuneCore or any of those platforms, they have a, a way that you can say this is a cover song okay. and it'll attribute the, the royalties to the, the correct writers and you'll still get the royalties on the recording side. Yeah, it's genius now because if you upload, if, if like, for example, in a podcast, if I take a 20-second clip of a song, you know, say we take a Newsboy clip or we take a, and then we upload it to YouTube, they automatically know that is there. So it's a fingerprinted, yeah. So the maker of the podcast gets nothing in the monetization. Yeah. Monetization is how these companies um, they just know because of what's called metadata. Right. We're getting into the, this is like science, like the atoms and the nucleus exactly. and the cells. Yeah. But you get down to that cellular level, they just automatically know now. Yeah, it tracks it. It's, it's just a, it's an algorithmic thing. Somehow they're able to just figure it out. And they want to know because, uh, you know, you got to follow the money. Everybody <clears throat> wants their share of the pie. Right, yeah. I mean, and, and they should be, right? The original yeah. writers should, should get some some form of credit and compensation for it. Yeah. So the the next question is how did you transition from Christian to country music? Was it because certain people were coming in yeah. to the studio or because you had already earned a reputation? Okay, so I'll I'll come back to what I was talking about with this earlier. You couldn't make this record in the in the Christian music industry nowadays, this level of just weirdness and off the wallness and creativity. Yeah. That's you just can't do that. And that was what I that was always the kind of Christian music that I loved. A lot of where stuff has gotten really, really, um, I don't know what you would say, homogenized nowadays is probably the best way to say it because everything goes through K-Love. Right. Which, God bless them. You know, they're doing You've got K-Love and you got the fish pretty much that dominate. Yeah. If you're not on them, then you're not making a living. It's this, you just have to, you have yeah. to be on that as a songwriter. And so you have to write, it's such a narrow type of writing and art that you can create and a lot of it's worship stuff now where you know is is great to have on our sundays our churches need it um i started down the path of dipping a toe into that world because i saw the industry was shifting to that it was shifting away from like artists to mm -hmm. to, to churches mm -hmm. and so I, I started doing we did worship uh work with hillsong we did work with elevation we did work with bethel and you know they met some really really great people in those um in those ecosystems but for me just as a creative not even as like 
the business of it aside, that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we don't even have time to go down probably <laughs> on this podcast. But just the creativity of it, it's like how many versions of the same thing can you do before it becomes yeah. old? And so yeah. for me as a creative and artist, I just didn't really feel like there was a lot of room to grow and I, I kind of had worked with all the people that I ever dreamed of working with in that space. Um, I mentioned Newsboys, but you know the Mercy Me guys got to work with them. We're mutual friends over the years. Michael W. Smith did stuff with him, did stuff with Casting Crowns, did stuff with Jeremy Camp. All the people, Skillet, all the people that I like grew up listening to and actually re really respected ar artistically and musically. And as songwriters, like I, I did records with them, and it was like, okay, well, where do you grow from there? Mm -hmm. And so for me, country really uh, was not even on my radar until a band called High Valley came along. Okay. Um, they were the first attempt at like a Christian country band, which is where you would think of Ann Wilson or Zach Williams or Kane. It's actually a thing now. It wasn't a thing back then. Okay. And so they could never really get traction doing it. So we worked on their first records that were like, okay, we're just going to try to just do a modern sound of country record. And for whatever reason, I got thrown in the mix with that and we ended up producing some stuff from them. And I, I basically brought my pop influence to what they were doing, which was a bluegrass thing. And it ended up creating this really cool sound. And then they blew up in Canada. They ended up signing a record deal down here. We had two top 10 uh, American country radio singles. And it just opened my mind to like, okay, this is a whole different ecosystem. It's a whole different world of songwriting. And what I realized when I, I got into it was really quickly, like, it's a high bar. Yeah. It's a very high bar of songwriting. Like, the mm -hmm. there cannot be a filler word in there. It's, it's all about the lyric. Country music is its own language in itself. You have to learn to communicate in such a simple mm -hmm. way. And I found that uh, in the South. Mm -hmm. We come from different parts of the country, but we come to the South, there is a... There is a language, just like you have the Texas country, mm -hmm. you have the prairie country, you know, the Wyoming guys like uh, Ned Ledoux and, right. and uh, Ryan Bingham and those yeah. guys. Yeah. Um, it's, and, and when I was with Anthem, they do a lot of country songs. Mm -hmm. They do Tim McGraw, Keith Urban. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed that I turned in some songs because they're like, yeah, write for us. But because I come from such a sophisticated background, they're like, you've got like six chords, there's transitions, yeah. and we need to nail it down to like three or four chords. And then your words are too, people don't want to deal with that yeah. level of um, seriousness. Yeah. You know, uh, they want to deal with... <laughs> Having a good time. Yeah, well, that and, and you know, there's there's a time and a place for the heavy stuff too, but it just has to be written in a certain way. And so for me, it's been like going back to school or going to school for songwriting and just writing with some of the best writers, in my opinion, in the world. Yeah, they're here. That's why Ed Sheeran and people come here because they they know it's the songwriting capital of the world. What's so? What songs are you referencing for some of the the stuff? What I mean, you, th songs like to? songs like "House That Built Me," okay. Tom Douglas, uh, Alan Chamberlain, uh, the Miranda Lambert one. Like that's, I always point to that one because it's just like, it's so simple, but it does everything that you would hope a really good, well written country song would do. It's got the heartstrings. It hits. It's the dagger of like the nostalgia and thinking yeah. of where you grew up. Yeah. Um, but getting really, really specific with the visuals, talking about the, the, the oak in the, in the front yard where your favorite dog was buried next to. Like, oh, totally. Those specific things where in pop and in rock lyrics, it's often doesn't, like that's almost too specific for, yeah. for like a, if it was a Guns N' Roses song, that would just feel awkward to sing, right? Yeah. And, but, but in country, that's what it's about. And, and Dolly Parton is the perfect example of this. Code of Many Colors is, in my opinion, one of the best songs ever written. Yeah, she knows how to die. She knows yeah. how, how to communicate it. It's, uh, you know, my buddy Kiefer Thompson of Thompson Square, yeah. we wrote a couple yeah. songs together. He had the opportunity to tour and open for Merle Haggard. Mm. And so he went on Merle's bus, he got invited, and he was very intimidated. So he gets on Merle Haggard's bus, he goes, hey, do you mind if I ask you a question about songwriting? 
And Marl's like, shoot, kid. And yeah. he goes, tell me the general process, because you've heard, you are the best songwriter. This is, yeah, and right. Chris, Chris Christofferson will back this up. You are the greatest songwriter in this business. Yeah. How do you go about doing that? How can I write mm -hmm. an amazing song? And his answer was, well, I just look around me and see the grand scope of it all, and I put it down. <laughs> and he, he's like, so that's the advice, that's it? I just have to look just around? Just look around. <laughs> and that's where you know a certain writer has his own way of doing things, and nobody can tap into that mm -hmm. except him, which is why you're doing the hands-on. Well, that's where the art of it, yeah. you know, Dolly Parton never had anybody teaching her how to write songs. It yeah. was just the way she looked at the world. Like, that's what songwriting is, it's a way of looking at the world. Yeah. We can teach, which is what we do with our academy, the technicality of it and the craft of it, and that's important to learn, too. And, you know, you'll watch even probably guys like Merle Haggard or Dolly over the years, like, even what they do and how they write changes because yeah. they're getting better at the craft of it and just learning new ways to do things. And, and that's the part that we can teach. The art part is where it's like, I don't know. I just know that, that the way you just said that moves me in a way that I've never heard that before. Yeah. Yeah, very poetic. Very poetic, but very simple and very just straight to your heart. Yeah, because in music, we're communicating what people feel. They just don't know how to express it. That's why we give songs. Yeah. And we, I, in the day, created mixtapes. Yeah, for and sure. And I used to have a mixtape for January, February, and this was my journal of what I was thinking. And then when I was dating, and even my wife today, I made it. For one of the first things I did was make her a playlist. Yeah. You know, I had, like, some Dirk Bentley, you know, because yeah, uh, yeah. so, he's a real smooth, romantic <laughs> oh, of course, kind of, of course, a guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I got two last questions. Yeah. One, um, who co-wrote Hold On To It for Tim McGraw with you, and yeah. and it feels like that's similar to his very popular hit, Humble and Kind. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I love that song, too. That's yeah. another great example. It's a classic. Yeah, Lori McKenna. That's, that's a, that's oh, a classic. I didn't know, that's I didn't a classic know Lori, Lori McKenna that. song. So she wrote that song. Um, I wrote Hold On To It with um, Jimmy Yeary, who is one of my favorite writers and singers on the planet. Like, he is just so, so good. He just did the uh, George Jones tribute at the NSAI Awards last year where he was wearing the ac George Jones's actual jacket, like <laughs> playing his <laughs> classic songs. He's just so good. So he, I wrote it with him, um, and then we had a brand new artist named Ryan Larkins, actually, okay. who is another one of my favorite voices ever, but, you know, up and coming. And so we just wrote it. We got, we were in there writing for Ryan. Record. It was, a, it was a, a day just like any other. I had two rights booked that day, mm -hmm. got double booked somehow, and I was actually not super pumped about either of them, because I was like, this is a new, I was just in, a, in, in my head yeah. about being stupid or whatever, <laughs> and uh, I, I was debating on canceling both of them, but I, I, I talked to Kenley, who's my publisher at Sony, he's like, I feel like you need to do this right, this, this, this Ryan and this Jimmy one, this is going to be a good yeah. one. And so we wrote that, that song in like an hour. Um, it was so fast, just kind of came right out. Some of the biggest hits are written right on the fly. It's, well, it's like the, it's the magic of the first write. Like, this was the first time the three of us wrote together. Okay. And I, I always think there's something about that, when it's just the first time you get in a room with a certain combo. I have it today. Like, I, I have very high expectations for today, because it's a combo I've never done before. I always think there's something about the first right. The chemistry. You're just, just not happens. you're you're not overthinking stuff. You're just let's just jump in and get something done. Yeah, let's see what happens. Yeah. And so fortunately with, with hold on to it, it just we felt like it hit the nail on the head for like just what all three of us the values and the um, the things that we want to leave behind as as a part of our legacy as songwriters, like that that song really sums it up perfectly. And so anytime somebody like a McGraw you know, he's been posting so much about that song, which is crazy. Like, he was just saying, he, he just goes on and on about how, like, this is one of my favorite lyrics I've ever sang. And so you hear a guy like that saying that, it's just an amazing thing. Well, it goes to his life experience, and it's almost like he's sharing a testimony of, you know, there were those days where he was, 
you know, an alcoholic, he was overweight, and Faith was like, man, if you don't get your act together, we're done. We're done. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. And he loves that woman so much mm -hmm. that, you know, he's like the perfectly chiseled 60-year-old exactly. man. Yeah. Um, He's like who everyone should want to be when they turn 60. <laughs> ab absolutely, you know, absolutely. No yeah. pun intended with the abs. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's going to lead to my last question, but I got to tell you a George Jones story. Yeah. So when my wife and I came through Nashville the very first time, I had, I mean, you know, I had my entire uh, record label, my studio out in Salt Lake City. Yeah. And we just, we just decided to drive through. Never been to Nashville. And I, I'm big on ancestry and genealogy, mm. and I have this odd thing of liking to go to cemeteries mm. and visiting the graves of people I have great respect for. So I went out to Hermitage, and I, I this is what I did in Nashville. Mm. Instead of going to shows, I went to George, uh, Johnny Cash's grave, thanked him for the influence he had on my life. Wow. And then I went to Woodlawn Cemetery and I was looking for George Jones. Oh, wow. Because I was a fan of his music, plus his lifestyle taught me that, man, you gotta make good choices. And he's got that mm -hmm. song, Choices. Right, yeah. Which is very haunting. Yeah. But as I was, you know, the sun was starting to set and I could not find George Jones' grave. And I was disappointed. Oh. But finally, I was in this other section, and I was looking, and I saw in the bushes a possum. Now, people need to know that George Jones was known as the possum because he had beady little eyes. So people, <laughs> people would call George Jones the possum. I never even knew that. Yeah, so I'm looking, and I see this possum. And I'm like, this is really trippy. And, and I, I go, hey, where's the grave? And the possum literally turned his head, and then I saw it. This massive stone that says, step right up, oh, come wow. on in. Wow. And then I went over and I paid my respect to George Jones. He had this, then this is typical. So the possum was directing you to the To, to the, the possum, stone. it said the possum. Wow. Step right up, come on in, which is his song. But it's it's typical That's crazy. <laughs> typical of his lifestyle, but he built the biggest section of the cemetery mm. as an honor to him. But he mm. also has graves for his band members that mm. were broke and couldn't afford graves. Wow. So he's surrounded by all his band members. That's pretty that's pretty amazing. And someone needs to write that song. Yeah. George Jones' legacy. Yeah. You know, seriously. buried with friends. That's, yeah. Yeah. Man. But, uh, yeah, the last question, because you talked about how, hold on to it, you know, that shift in country music. It's not far from the Christian values. Exactly. That you had. Uh, and I'm sure your mom is pleased. Well, honestly, and that's, I feel like I'm able to write the kind of songs that I, you can write about life in country. Yeah. In, in Christian, nowadays, it's such a narrow way you have to say things and write things. And a lot of artists end up feeling like it's a little less authentic and a little less honest or whatever. And you just have to kind of, it's, you know, writing a worship song is very different than writing Hold On To It. And I just feel like I'm better at, at those kind of songs. So I'm doing probably not that different of what I would have been doing in Christian anyway. Yeah. It's just in a different, market you're just shifting to the way that snare kicks in and right or glory days like pulls. by gabby barrett that's another another big one that we have it's literally faith family and, yeah. and and godly values like that's what that song is about i remember gabby when she was first starting out because I, I played the white house with thompson square and yeah. gabby was there gabby was so focused hmm. that she wasn't socializing yeah and this is her personality because yeah, she's that's, that's very she yeah. focused on giving the audience everything mm -hmm. rather than the people yeah. that are trying to just hang out with her yeah. and make her feel good. And I have respect for her on that. But yeah, it's amazing, Seth, how you're able to integrate all that stuff into what you're doing now. Uh, finally, maybe I do have one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For anybody who is a musician or loves music, maybe wants to get into the industry, but what's your advice to people like I mean, you got it. Like the that? big thing I would say, um, just to wrap it up, I, I, we, we, you got to plug into a community. Okay. That's the only way that you're going to 
have any, whether you want it to be your career or not, it's just a lot more fun when you do it with other people. And that's where co-writing becomes everything. You, you don't ever create anything on your own. You know, yeah. you create ideas and then you bring them into the room and yeah. they kind of get workshopped. And, but I, I just always, that's why we started our academy. That's why we started Song Chasers. Um, we've actually got a thing that we created that I'm really excited about called the Hitmaker Challenge, where it allows people to co-write a song with me. Um, it's totally free. People can sign up for it if they want to at fullcirclemusic.com slash challenge. And that, that will basically give you everything you need to know in terms of like, okay, here's how you do it. Here's also how you find people to co-write with. But that's the biggest thing is you just got to find your, find your tribe, find your community and plug in. So yeah, but yeah that's the Hitmaker Challenge. If they want to check that out, it's fullcirclemusic.com slash challenge. Uh, well, brother, I love you and I'm, yeah. I'm so excited yeah, for thanks everything for, Thanks for having doing. me on. All right, man. Appreciate you. Okay, check out uh, fullcircle.com. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. Cause you took my